So we said in this video, we are going to discuss, discuss the principal component analysis, PCA. Just like in our rich regression video, I'm going to put a lot of theory in this video so that we cover a lot of ground. And if you don't understand, I'm going to, uh, in the next video, I'm going to do a very simple uh, example just to, just to cement some of the theory that we're going to discuss in this video. Same thing that we did for rigid regression. Hopefully that, that, that helped because I know the first video was a bit of theory and then the second video tried to use a simple, simple example just to, just to explain the principle. So that's what we're going to do here. So principal component analysis, it is used in both dimension reduction and unsupervised learning. But for our purposes right now, we're going to use it for the, its power in dimension reduction. Right? So imagine we have ad spending by Coca-Cola, ad spend by Coca-Cola in thousands of rands. So rands is just a currency. It's a currency in South Africa where I am. So it's going to be ad spending in rands and this is going to be population per country in Africa. So this is going to be in millions. This is going to be in millions of people, not Ryan's system. This is going to be millions of people, right? In millions and millions of people. So of course we are going to have different ad spending depending on how many people there are. Countries like Nigeria that have many people, maybe Coca-Cola would want to put a bit of money in there. Countries like Lesotho that doesn't have many people, nah, probably they wouldn't want to uh put much ad spending there cool so i'm going to define something called the principal principal component direction principal component direction this is defined as the direction the direction uh, the data along which along which um along which uh observations observations vary 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 the most right they vary the most in that direction so that is called the principal component direction the direction the direction um in which the observations vary vary the most observations vary the most when you just look at this graph you can already tell which direction the observations vary the most and i'm going to draw it now this is the direction i think you can already see that this is the direction that the observations vary the most they vary the most in this direction there is no other direction that they vary the most because if you draw a line like this a straight line like this not really is it going to be perpendicular to this to the trend yeah in the data not really they're not going to vary the most in this this is the direction they vary the most right they vary the most in this direction and so we called that the principal component direction right and this line is going to be to be to be exact we are going to call it the first principal component direction this is the first principal component direction don't worry if you don't we are going to describe in the with using an example how we can come up with the component directions for now just know the theory behind it and then we'll describe it we'll describe the, the an example later right so so um, we can see that this is the direction in which where there is greatest variability in the data so if we projected we're going to see this in the next video as well if we projected the observations onto this line right we project all observations onto this line project op op onto this line each point each point when we project it onto this line right we can see that this is going to this point is going to be here and this point is going to be there it's going to be there right this this line is the one that gives us most variability because look at a line like this. If we were saying, ah, but what about the horizontal line? If we drawn a horizontal line like this, if we drawn a horizontal line like that, right? How was our um, when we had projected our points? Our points were going to be projected like this. Do you know what a pro projection? Maybe I'm skipping. I'm skipping something here. Projection. So when you're projecting a point to a line, you're basically just creating a perpendicular line connecting that point and 
the line you're projecting to. So let's say this is the line and this is the point. You're basically just creating a line that is at right angles with the line you're projecting to and the point. So that's what I'm doing here. For this one that is slanted, the blue line, these are making these projections are making 90 degrees with that blue line, as you can see. And if you have a horizontal line like this, instead of projecting it at an angle, project and say from your line, draw 90 degrees going to the point. So that's what I'm doing here. 90 degrees going to my point. Going, going to my point. So this one here, this point, this point, it is a projection like this to the black line and a projection like this to the blue line, right, to the blue line. So if we project our points, what we are going to see, what we are going to see is the variability on the black line is going to be from here to here, from here to there. That is the variability, right? And if you if you calculate the variability here, it's going to be of the black line. It's going to be less than the variability of from here to all the points that are between these two. The variability on the blue line is more than the variability on the black line. That is a bit slant. That is a bit horizontal, more horizontal. So the blue line is the direction that gives us that gives us the highest variability, the largest variability, and that becomes our first principal component direction. That is the direction that we choose, the one with the uh, largest variability, with the largest variability. Right? We are going to see. We are going to see an example with with, with calculation. We are going to see how that works. Right. So cool. Um, if, for example, let's just say, so that is the blue line. So let's just say the blue line can be rewritten as something like this. We are going to rewrite the blue line as Z1 is equal to 0 0.83. If you remember, we are looking for our phi's, right? We are going to see how these, these 0 0.83's are going to be attained. Pop minus pop. I'm going to explain something here. 0 0.544 add minus add uh, minus add these are the mean this is the mean of the population and this is the mean for the ad spend and when we subtract the population minus its mean so each population point each population is going to be subtracted by its mean here we are doing what is called mean normalization i think we saw this before where we normalize the data using the mean we are basically just minim normalizing. Why are we doing that? Because if you look at our data, the population is measured in millions and the ad spend is measured in thousands. Those different scales can be very difficult for our machine learning models. They can be very difficult. We do not want to deal with, with, with scales and stuff like that. So here we are basically just mean normalizing. Mean normalizing. That's all we are doing. Right? Mean normalizing. You can write write that var variable maybe as pop like this, whatever you want to write. As long as you know that first you normalize, first you normalize, after you normalize, after you mean normalize, then you are, your quest is now to calculate, you remember our phi's. This is phi 1, this is phi 2, and this is 2 1, and this is 1 1, because we are dealing with Z1. So imagine we've calculated and then we came up with this Z. We came up with the, that Z as our Z1, right? These ones here, these files, these files, they are called, they are called the load, loading, loading scores. They are called the loading scores. This video is full of theory, but we'll see the practical side of it in the next video. These are called loading scores, right? So we... Basically, we basically found this Z1 or this principal direction by maximizing var, var 1, 1 of pop minus pop minus its mean plus phi 2, 1 of add minus add bar. Yeah, so we basically maximized this, the variance. You understand? We've just maximized the variance. That's that's what we basically did, right? And 
for us not for for us not to affect the trend in the data by introducing these files we can constrain the files themselves we can constrain the files themselves such that squared plus is equal to one so once once we we are like no we don't want the files to affect because we will be like okay dude i'm going to put five 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 one one equal to one million and then that's going to affect the variance that was original in the data originally in the data when we limit it like this we limit it to a range that we limit it to a range where we know very well that we didn't affect the variance that was in the data the direction that was chosen was because it was the one that it there the, it is a, the one that is the maximum variance in the original data itself we didn't affect it by introducing these files we did not that's that's basically why we have to restrict it to that right so uh, with we um so if we are going to create if we are going to create many of these z's we can do the same thing we can create many 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 of these z's we can create a z2 z3 z4 z5 right um in the next video so yeah we said we said it it is the maximum variable right maximum we said our first first principle com first principle direction first principle component direction is the one with the maximum variability right or we can just say it is the line line closest to the data it is the line that is closest to the data this is very important because in pci we, we, we then ask the next question what does closest to the data mean we're going to see that in the next video how do we measure closeness to the data all right we'll see that in the next in the next video um let's see so that is that is our first principal component how do we then um find the second principal component well, what we can do is now that we have found our first principal component like that what we are going to do our blue line is the first principal component right what we can do is then rotate that blue line we're going to rotate that blue line such that it is horizontal we're going to make it horizontal and our points our points are going to rotate with it they're obviously going to rotate with it right they're going to rotate with it they will rotate with it so that now that now we're going to make it the x-axis sort of it becomes sort of like the x-axis i'm just putting quotes you cannot see them yeah for, for, for obvious reasons but i'm putting in quotes that this becomes our x-axis we've just made it horizontal um so now well, what we can do to find now to find the z2 we do not have to do calculations we do not have to do calculations to find it the second principal um component what we are going to just do is to find a line that is perpendicular that is perpendicular to this z1 find a line sorry it's not scrolling um find a line that is perpendicular to this and this becomes our z2 find a line that is perpendicular to our z1 then that becomes our second principal co principal component um so the second principal component z2 it is a linear combination of the variables that is uncorrelated with z1 we do not want it to be correlated to z1 right otherwise otherwise if they are correlated if z1 and z2 are correlated then there's no linear combination there you know what i mean we are pre pretty much hiding z1 inside z2 if they are correlated but if they are not correlated then it means z2 has introduced new information that z1 didn't have at all and them being uncorrelated because we want them to be uncorrelated the consequence of wanting them to be uncorrelated leads to them being at right angles to each other they do not affect each other at all the information that is in z1 is at 90 degrees to the information that is in z2 you get what i mean which means which means that information does not affect each other they're uncorrelated so the consequence of us wanting the principal component directions to be uncorrelated is we end up putting we, we are forced 
to just put them at 90 degrees to each other which is good for us because once we calculate z1 it will be easy for us to calculate z2 because we just look for a line that is perpendicular to that right um, so in our in our case because we had that z1 you remember that z1 that we had here this z1 that we had our z2 can be written as something like this maybe our z2 now our z2 will come up and come up to be something like this 0 0.554 uh, pop minus pop minus, minus 0 0.839 this line is perpendicular to the original z1 that we had right it's perpendicular to this z1 that we had mm. so here so here we've just described the high levels of what it means to be a principal component direction and what it means to get another principal component direction let's say from z1 because of this because they are supposed to be uncorrelated they have to be at 90 they are going to be at 90 degrees to each other right this might be difficult to be like yo that's too much too, too, too much to to take in let's go into the next video and look at an example and the example is going to be so i, I hope it's going to be so simple that these concepts will start making sense hopefully after the next exam the next video if you come back to this one the concepts will start clicking like oh that's why that's why we said this that's why we said it this that's why we 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 normalize that's why we normalized or oh, what did we mean by closest to the data maybe that's that that will make sense maximum variability what is the effect of that we'll see that in the next video